and in a wider world. But equally, how can you do that through your customer base? Now, as the guys mentioned, we are ranked in the GlaveScan Sustainability Corporate Leadership as one of the more sustainable companies around. Um, what's interesting here for me is that we are generally, alongside Patagonia, a lot smaller than Unilever's and Ikea's and Matura's. Um, but through a consistent commitment to sustainability, to the results that we've had, and through influencing our stakeholders and influencing through business schools, such as the ones that you're involved in and you represent, that's how we've been able to use our sphere of influence to promote more sustainable behaviour. And I found this little quote from Rayleigh. He's not with us anymore, he passed away in 2011, but this man was a visionary. So here he was saying that, you know, if we succeed in Mission Zero, we would spend the rest of our days harvesting our old products and other forms of petrochemicals. And we cycle them into new materials. We'd find ways to convert sunlight into energy. We'd stop any scrap going to landfill and any emissions. And by, you know, this is what we've been on a, a mission to do for 25 years, and we've had a good amount of success. But I like this phrase at the end, um, this concept of, We'll be doing well by doing good. And I think that's a very interesting debate for how important purpose is now for any business, whether you're a manufacturer, whether you're a bank, whatever you do, purpose is now very important. You have a responsibility for the world. But it's, I also find this interesting because I can use it as a checklist to, to see if we, we were able to get to raise vision and to realize it. Now for us, a couple of examples or a thought around the influence of nature on us for the circular economy. Nature doesn't do waste. The waste for one kingdom always becomes useful in some ways for another. Nature's had a good back history in being able to be circular. It's got 3.8 billion years of, of learning. Now one person that's helped interface on this journey is Dr. Janine Benyus, who's an expert in biomimicry or how you can use nature to inspire you to be more sustainable, but also more efficient. And one example from our past is how you even design a floor. So Janine took our designers out into the forest to explore how nature would design a, a floor. And what they came up with was this concept that patterns in nature are not linear. They're always quite random. And so we started designing the bulk of our carpet tiles to be random. By doing so, we were able to reduce the amount of waste and installation by 15% compared to broadening competitors at the time. We also were able to um, ensure that we could reduce our kind of frame scrap to one or two percent, and pretty lower than that now. But it also had other benefits. It made it quick and easy install and maintain. The arguments didn't just have to be sustainability, they could be commercial or practical. And that's another thing to think about in terms of, often when we talk about circularity, we, we sometimes focus a lot on the, the material, we focus a lot on a world we know. But are we talk to the people in the business that want to know how functional is it? How easy is it to use? How could this help with other aspects of the business? Now for Interface, we have a new mission, it's called Climate Take Back. And it's to reverse the effects of global warming. And a key part of that is a commitment to the circular economy. And I'm proud to sh share that out of all the materials we use in our products, 58% come from recycled or bio-based sources for our carpet tiles. A bit different for our, our others. Um, and that goes up to 90 or yeah, 87, 90% for certain products in the Americas and in Europe. But that's another point I want to make, which is when we talk about how you measure the circularity or circular success of a business, I think you do have to do a metric that looks across all of your portfolio and operations. I think it's very easy to have a, a hero product, but if your hero product was 5% of your business, and for 95% of the business you were tearing through materials in an circular way, I don't think you can really make a claim of being a circular. Um, industry, but we can come to that discussion in the discussion. So that's the story behind how we got to this 58% um, 
kind of benchmark as it's today, it's a lot of work with our suppliers. We had to use our power and of influence as a manufacturer to challenge our suppliers to create materials with higher levels of, of recycled content. Even from the outset in the 90s, we, we weren't interested in people saying to us, oh, this material is recyclable. We wanted actual recycled content in our, in our product. And when, initially in the 90s, when we went to our, our yarn suppliers and some of the larger guys, I'm not going to name the shame, but some of the largest chemical companies that are in the world today in their studios, they weren't interested in chain. They, 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 we, were, we weren't able to persuade them because they didn't think they had to move for us. So we started to talk to, that, to talk to their smaller competitors, smaller, more agile, more nimble companies that are up and coming that were willing to be more circular. And one of those was a company called Aquafil, who are now, is now going to be one of the largest providers of 100% recycled nylon yarn. They're our biggest supplier. So for us, the lesson there was sometimes when you're faced with a wall of the biggest suppliers stopping you from being more sustainable, have a think about looking to get support from the small suppliers that are willing to be more, more agile. Just have a look at the clock. I need to speed up a little bit. So another thing that we've focused on is circularity is not just being about the environment, but also being about having a social and environmental benefit. Now these nets on the left are made out of nylon six, um, which is exactly the same material that we use now, carpet tile. And we have a project called Networks, and we've been running it since 2011, which is a partnership between Conservation Charity of the Zoological Society of London, our yarn provider that I mentioned Aquafil and ourselves, that takes waste fishing nets that are made out of Ireland six, sorts them, cleans them, and gets them put into a mainstream supply chain, with the funds from those nets going back into the communities. Um, a key aspect of that has been creating community banks, making sure there's a fair price for those nets, but also looking to improve the livelihoods of those communities by kind of building things like seaweed farming or looking to create marine protected areas to make sure that fish stocks remain higher or that you can run some ecotourism or that you can store mangroves. Um, and that's been a huge success for us in terms of we've been able to collect over 260 metric tons of nets. Um, in doing so, we've given 2,000 families access to finance and we've been able to create a healthier, cleaner marine environment for around 60,000 people. I think where that gets interesting is this, this question of collaboration and this question of collaborating with your supply chain and with charities and NGOs. Because at the outset, we were just looking for having a social and environmental benefit whilst, uh, whilst helping our supply chain, but also helping communities. But I think what was interesting here was how it grew. So after the nets and the community finance, what we were able to do was build enough trust with the community to create these marine protected areas. So as more trust grew with the communities, they started to reinvest into seaweed farming. Seaweed that could be used in the food and cosmetics industry, that could even be used to make bio-based plastics in the future in a sustainable way. So there's an opportunity to give these communities access, not just the supply chain for waste and nylon, but also for for seaweed too. Moving on a bit further, we did okay with the you know, 260 um, kind of tons of nets, but we actually need to do much more. And in terms of looking for scale and circularity, a, a lot of that is about finding ways to bring other companies in with you. So we're part of a group called Next Wave, a working group of manufacturers who are looking to keep plastic in our economy through circular solutions and out of our, our ocean. And I think as a large group, we're looking to, by 2025, ensure that 25,000 tonnes of nets, well not just nets, but all kinds of plastic, are, are recycled or reused and got into products and are not ocean bound. Um, just wrapping up with the final couple of the slides, um, we've also been working on our take back. So our take back scheme is called re-entry um, and we will work, collect our tiles back from our customers at end of life. And what we'll look to do is to reuse 
Limbers flooring again for SMEs um, or for housing associations. We'll look to repurpose them. Um, for instance, some of it is going into stable flooring at the moment. We've designed our tiles to, to recycle them. So where we can, we will look to make the backing into backing and yarn into yarn. But that's proven quite tricky. Um, and we do have a waste energy option as a, a last resort, but we are able to make sure that's less than five or six percent at the moment. And I think one of the interesting discussion around here, and maybe I'll save the fact to our discussion, is we have the ways and the routes to take our product to end of life. But actually getting product back, putting a commercial proposition to get materials back from our customers has proven to be really difficult. We've even tried a leasing model back in the, the noughties. Um, but for a number of reasons, that's, that's, that's never quite taken up and become moved from that theory to reality. So a little process on re-entry. Now reuse is really our first priority because if we can get people to give our products a proper life, then uh, and a longer life, then we're being much more efficient with our use of materials. And this is also a great opportunity for us to work with social enterprises because we work with smaller businesses. We can help them set up as viable enterprises for a secondary market. In addition, they can look at creating employment opportunities. Um, this is Kylie, she's somebody who was out of work in Wales and um, Porth, but has had a real gift for the gap and was a salesperson who was waiting to be a sales manager but had never been given the opportunity. And now social enterprise partner Greenstream were able to give her the opportunity um, to develop their skills. Equally fitters, carpet tiles and flooring fitters, great opportunity to create some new work there. So when we've been looking to replicate this across Europe, the way I was going to finish and kind of open to discussion was a couple of reflections for us to consider. I think we need to change perceptions around waste in that I think it's, we're still, we're, I'm thinking as a convert here, but we're in a, a continent um, where waste is not given the value it should be given. When people see scrap, they think it's, they don't think of it as anything valuable. Um, I say this about the majority, not about those that are on this call. It's, they're in the mindsets of people, there's still a way. So you throw something away. When the reality is there is no way, um, and you know, material is going to have an impact after you finish using with it, and you've got to think about how you can be responsible with that. Linked to that is this law of cheap and new. And I imagine I can imagine that this is something that's been discussed on the Patagonia call. You know, for us in the flooring industry, there's a lot of manufacturers who would happily create flooring tiles are much cheaper and um, get people to buy and buy and buy and consume and consume and consume with no thought about what would happen at the end of their life. Um, and we need to work out how we can make sure that perceptions of value and waste change so we, we prove, move against this kind of cheap and new approach. I think in terms of a, a take back hierarchy, that concept of reuse and repurposing is key. Repurposing is an interesting one. Um, often it means kind of it can mean downcycling, um, but until we all have perfect recycling solutions, I think we have to think about it in terms of stepping stones. So I can be a bit relaxed on the repurposing side as long as I know where we're going in the future to be able to recycle more. And then my final two points are around scale and replication. I see a lot of good individual products that are very sustainable, but I don't see them being adopted and brought into to scale by some of the, the bigger companies. They're always often a niche. Equally, I think there's a challenge where when we think about rethinking the take back of products, perhaps we need to look broader than individual manufacturers. And it's something that has to be collaborations between different sectors or even competitors. And then finally, we touched on this in the first session, the role of EU and local legislation in in making the circular economy work. It is really hard to get waste across borders in Europe, as you'll know, um, in some ways for very important reasons, but also with the after effect that that sometimes stifles our ability to be, to be circular. But there's, yeah, with the Green Deal and the work we've been hearing that the Commission doing, there's, there's reason to be 
to be optimistic too, but we have to make sure that that, that happens and that that the world of business and the world of academic academia um, and the world at large adopts a more circular solution. So at that point, I'm going to stop sharing and open it up to to the discussion. Yes. Oh. John, thank you uh, so much. This is a very a fantastic story. <clears throat> and uh, I'm really impressed that uh, by something very simple that you, what you shared is that uh, I think uh, most people forgot the most simple and important question as how modern nature would design something, in this case, a floor. And uh, this is, I think, really a key question. Uh, thanks again. So we, there are some questions. So I would ask the participants. Um, uh, I saw already a few questions on the on the, the the chat, but in this session we have less people than in the first session. So I would like to invite you, if you have a question, that you can raise your hand and uh, 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 make yourself visible, and then I will give the floor to you. In this case, the floor is kind of the, the best word, I think. Um, uh, and then you can ask the question yourself uh, to John. And we have already a few questions. So I had a few questions, but I think there will be more. So let us start with the first question already on the app. And may I invite uh, Geoff Moore um, to, uh, to, to ask the first question to, to John. You, you chat already, but maybe you can explain also. Please introduce yourself. Thank you. Uh, John, thank you very much. And, and the the question would pro probably, if you've read it in the chat, will appear to be critical. Let me first of all say that uh, I've used the interface case study uh, with my students on an MBA class for many years. Um, it's a really an excellent and inspiring case study. Uh, the, the updates that we can get off your website uh, to sort of inevitably the case study is a few years old is, is, uh, are really excellent. But one of the challenges that, that I noticed in the case study, and we pick, I pick up with the students, and, and I picked up from your presentation as well, is uh, you know, you've been on this journey a long time, much longer than most other companies, um, 26 years if we go from 1994. And, and one of the slides you put up said, you know, we, we're 58% recycled or bio-based content now. Um, and that, although you've got lots of other things that are closer to 100%, that seems to me to be a key one. And it's still, as it were, only 58% after 26 years. So it raises two questions, I think. One is, um, how long before you reach 100%? And I suppose, what are the barriers to doing that? Which, some of which I think you've already mentioned. Um, and, and then the second obvious question is, okay, because you were a kind of first mover in this, it probably does take longer. How long is it gonna take other companies? Because if it's gonna take them 26 plus years, it's probably going to be too late. So, yeah. Thanks, Jeff, for your for your questions, and they're you know they're really fair. I'd say on the the fifty eight percent, and when we'll get to near a uh, hundred, like on the yarn, which is kind of a third of the impact of the uh, of the product, we're we're there in terms of we were able to have yarns at hundred um, percent from resold content. The challenge we're facing is on the the backing, um, and. I think we're looking at using some, working out what other materials we can, we can use. Um, but I would say a fee, it would be feasible to get that figure to be nearer 80% in the next five years, and then within the next 10 to reach 100 across the board. I'd like it to be sooner, but I want to be kind of realistic in terms of changing manufacturing lines and seeing what's there. Um, I think, yeah, I think for us that would be a realistic ask. If I can make it have any quicker, um, we certainly will. Now, the, comp the kind of what about other companies? One is when when your competitors see your business succeeding by being sustainable, and when the customer base in the market you work in is asking for more sustainable products, you end up having a race to the top. Like the carpet tile um, sector specifically, is a, a number of you know it's one of the Number of sustainable players. It's one of the more sustainable parts of the built environment. It's kind of a yeah, it's a bit of a funny quirk. But, um, but the reason for that quirk is the companies that have been responsive in terms of being proactive to create sustainable products and have their R and D budgets aligned to do so, and the ones that are willing to listen to their customer base 
is increasingly asking for higher sustainability standards, um, it becomes a bit of a race, race to the top. I think one of the challenges there is, is that I think it works for the top end of the market and the mid end of the market, but for the bottom end of the cheapest cheerful stuff, that's trickier because that's people um, in, people are more willing to, to not to not choose that sustainable choice. There's less demand there. And that's why I think you need you need your, your laws and your regulations to highlight. I think we're we are likely to see if I look at the circular economy guidance from the commission, a focus on half it through the focus on textiles within the draft documents on extended reduce responsibility. And I you know if that is driven that will mean that it come it comes along. But I think it's a there's a certain amount of competitiveness between business that can be quite positive, um, but it needs that alone will not be enough. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. Thank you, uh, uh, John, for your answer. Thank, thank you, Geoff, for this uh, excellent question because it's, uh, it gives uh, re re really more clarification, more insights in the, in the case or interface. Uh, I also noticed that there was already a question in the chat from Mariana. Mariana, uh, could I give the floor to you? Yes, good evening. Um, hi, John. Thank you for your fascinating presentation. Um, okay, uh, maybe I should give you some background. Uh, I'm a PhD student in environmental and I'm uh, studying indicators that will translate how can we measure uh, the transition to circular economy but i'm also from brazil and we don't have a green deal there we cannot just talk about uh, sustainability and uh, environmental so thinking about how to talk to them to the industries in my country um, i'm interested in how to to how to connect the investments and the payback, the, the profits of those investments. And also, uh, if it's possible to connect an, uh, an increment of market share because of those actions. Thank you. Cool, thanks for your question, Marianne. I think, um, I mean, we, we, we sell in Brazil, so we have a, we have a, a sense of some of the challenges um, that are faced there, especially with current leadership. But, um, what I'd say is you're, you're looking for those examples where companies are, are thriving and you can, like for us it's quite easy because you can kind of, we're a listed company on NASDAQ, um, we report to, to Wall Street every month, so, you know, the, the financial measures are reasonably are good, but you know, we're a, a small to mid-sized industry compared, kind of globally compared to much larger ones. I think you'd be looking for a, a combination, looking for those brands We've been able to show a lot of success. I mean, Unilever would talk around how they're more sustainable um, brands and ones that embrace more circular approaches are growing probably double some of the some of their others. And so that's that's a good index there. Market share is a tricky one because I think um, it really depends on what the segment is whether that's going to help you or not, I, we can have a longer discussion. But I mean, it's because effectively what you're looking to show is that the more sustainable companies uh, are better investment choices. Actually, and this has just popped into my head, if you've got any friends that work as analysts, because I would say the other key thing is having a discussion with a financial community about how they measure investment risk. Um, I mean, I, an example of that would be Prada's latest loan from Credit and Ricolet has a load of terms whereby its lending terms are indexed to its sustainability performance. Why couldn't you have something similar on kind of circular approaches? If you were a business that was either a big waste producer or waste user, could you not, um, as a, uh, in terms of the loans and the bonds, tie some of those tie your performance to your your sustainability performance to your loan loan term. So that might I mean that's another it's a bit of a curveball. I apologise, but it's something that I think I've seen recently. It's a natural extension of what Prada and Credit Agricola um, are doing. 
But I, yeah, I think one thing I would suggest there is talking to the financial community about how they, you know, what's the risk profile. Like you could even go even with the, the interface, I think if you, you know, you do invest. <laughs> but I think it's, that's another nice way to kind of take your, your research. Just an idea, but that's what I would look at. And that might be more solid than market share um, and give you also an opportunity to use lots of different industries as an example. Thank you, John. Did, did he answer your question? Yes, yes. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Um, uh, oh, Eva, I think you might have put your mute. Um, the next question is from May. Um, May, you, you asked something about the cost of the product. Could you explain your question, please? Sure, thank you so much. Um, thanks so much, John, for your fascinating presentation. Um, I'm not very familiar uh, with your company and the industry, so I was wondering if you could just let us know about the cost of the products. Where do they stand with regards to the market and the competition? And then the second part of the question is, I was wondering, with regards to the reuse, repurpose, recycling and recover, are you able to capture how much uh, you benefit the environment? So a positive kind of environmental value creation through all your initiatives. Thank you so much. Thanks for your, your question, May. On the, the first part, like, um, our answer in two ways, in terms of where we play in the market, we play in the kind of mid to high le level of, um, of flooring. Um, we do sell across all, all kind of price points, but that's our sweet spot. So, and that's quite in, in the circular economy, that's actually quite a nice one to, to play in because you're having impact on a wide enough scale, but also you're not a niche being really high up, but equally you're not you're not at the bottom and where it's much more difficult to, to do your work. In terms of how you measure your KPIs and what your impact is from, from, a, from a take back, that's something that we've been working on. We're very good at doing it in relation to, like I can work out and do calculations based on how many, what reduction of carbon emissions we're, we're having, um, how many kilos or square meters we produce. But I think we need to evolve that things that we're looking at is thinking, well, what kind of social impacts are we, we having? Um, from a land use side, it's also interesting to see if we're stopping stuff going to the landfill, how, we, how that has more of an impact. Um, and then, yeah, those are one thing, I think that's something we're, we're working on. At the moment, we're good at carbon footprint and volumes, um, but it's very um, quantitative. And I would like to see some ways to get some new kinds of quantitative data, but also some more qualitative data. Um, like our networks project was really interesting because looking at trying to measure the social impact of changing your supply chain. Like if you think about if we once we support those communities um, and the externalities involved, the benefit that we would have provided isn't just buying the next round supply chain, but investing in a community's resilience investing in the communities and kind of biohabitat. And that's, I think we're looking at ways of how we can, we can measure that next time around. So really, really good question, but it's, um, yeah, it's very much on our, our thoughts at the moment. But the key takeaway for this group is your ability to measure impact is wider than you think it is. Fantastic, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you again for your question. Uh, I see a few more questions. I see questions from Sally. I see a question from Mariana Oliveira. Sally, could you uh, explain your question and ask your question? Oh, I've already done it. Sorry, it's me yeah, again. Let me give the floor to you to give more background about yourself, uh, to use yourself and also to, uh, to give the, the background of your question. Sorry, Ivo, are you speaking to me? Yes. Um, so my name is Sally Randalls. I'm Prof of Sustainability at Manchester Met uh, University. I have two colleagues on, Russell and Andrew Baird from Manchester also. Uh, thank you, John, and thank you, Ava. Thank you, uh, Abis, for this uh, super event. It's uh, really great. But my direct question to John was, 
uh, just if there's any possibility to kind of summarize the challenges you think face you in the next five years you're already a, a leader by a long way on circular economy so what challenges do you see for the next um five years and what you're prioritizing for those five years but if i may a follow-up question because um my colleague russell is um texting me at the same time um we noticed your head office is in bangalore so russell andrew and i've all worked in bangalore on teaching and research um and we want i wonder what the history is behind that quite surprising um uh, observation that your head office is in bangalore india where does that come from is that where the um Just to come forward, our head office is in the the atlanta georgia in usa our head office in india for our indian business is out of bangalore um, and the history of why our indian head office um, for the country head offices there is it was the growth of outsourcing and call centers um, which were one of the uh, a big drive for us in the growth of our business but what was interesting there is that we could also learn from some of the really cool recycling initiatives that are happening in Bangalore because Bangalore's one of, when it comes to plastics for example Bangalore is one of those interesting Really interesting city. So it's, it's it's not a HQ. A HQ is in Atlanta, Georgia, in the USA. But in terms of Bangalore, um, it's something where we followed the business. But a kind of externality was finding out about kind of waste wallers and and, and what's happening on the ground um, there. Some are, a lot of it positive, a lot of it challenging as well. So it was an interesting one for us. India is a very interesting market for the circular economy. A lot of opportunity for for everyone there. To go to your other question in terms of the priority for the next five years, for us, I think a, a key aspect will be getting a better commercial proposition for our take back. Because even though that we offer it, um, it needs to become the norm. Um, I think we need to again look at experimenting with product as a service. Um, we have a few leasing pilots underway, but again, the challenge, we need to overcome that challenge of People like choice. People don't, like our industry, you know, a lot of our customers don't want to be tied in for, for 10 years. So, um, there's a reason why Philips created Signify, but the, like Osram and some of their competitors haven't. And there's some accounting stuff and ownership stuff around that move. If you, if you lease, you move from becoming uh, a capital cost to a kind of operational ongoing cost. Um, and that needs to be addressed as well. But I, I, the overall trend is, I think we will see ourselves move more as a, a service. Um, another key trend for us will be looking at how we make sure any new materials that we use, because we're going to be experimenting, um, we've got plans to find ways to make carbon negative materials. How do you make sure that those are still circular, that you can still take them back? Um, how does it get you, go back to Jess' question, to make sure that you've got that high level of recycled or bio-based question and content uh, across the board. Um, and then a lot of us is how, you know, how do we move in the market? We, I think we are gonna have to become a little bit more political. We might need your help in this. Um, in that we've found ourselves in the US doing more lobbying. So we're lobbying for higher levels of recycled content. We've had to take on our own industry in California. Um, and even an industry body it was called cool, focus on carbon recycling. They were trying to they were quite clearly just wearing the hat of people that did not want to change. Um, so I think some more lobbying on our side. Although on the European context, I'm reasonably positive that looking at what's coming up with the um, the Commission, um, that the well, things will move a little bit quicker quicker here. Um, and that so that would be our. Outside. And then, yeah, I think it'll be interesting to think about cross-sector and cross-industrial approaches to rethinking waste. Um, this is not something where we need to move from individual companies doing a nice pilot here or having a nice showcase here into a, a whole sector going, you know what, taking that products, that's just what's done. It's just what makes sense. We, could, we should have been doing it for years. So I, I think that's a shift. All under the challenge of difficult economic conditions that we're going to face for the next 12 to 18 months as a result of 
COVID-19, which means we have to fight harder to make sure that progress is made, that we do develop a recovery that is green and inclusive. Okay. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you, Sally. Thank you, John. Uh, we have three minutes to go, and I see there's one question. Uh, Mariana Oliveira, she, you raised your hand. Could you ask your question, and then we can try to do it in three minutes, right? No, no, thank you. It's me again. I raised the hands uh, in the wrong moment. Uh, it's <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. But you found, at least you found how it works, right? <laughs> yes, yes. <it is. laughs> It does mean you get the first question in the next session. That's only fair. Yeah, but uh, uh, so I, I, I think we have to uh, finalize this uh, session at four and then we start again. We all know how it works uh, uh, for the next uh, session with Danone at uh, 4, 4 10. Um, uh, John, I would like to thank you for your presentation and also for your uh, answers, your openness, and also to create a kind of uh, a big picture, bigger picture of, uh, of uh, interface with, the over, with the, uh, more insights about the past and the future from a product that we use every day, but we take also the product for granted. And, and, and I think it's very good that we are aware of what you're doing and what you mean for, I think, for your industry. Um, um, so I think um, there are quite some uh, interesting lessons learned for us. And um, again, thank you so much uh, for your presentation and answering the questions. Um, so let's have again a few minutes break and the next session uh, starts in 10 minutes, uh, 12 minutes to be precise. And then we do the next case. Thank you very much. Thank you all, it was a pleasure and I wish you well on your own secular journeys. And we, we keep in touch, there's more to talk, I think. Thank you.